There are so many directors out there that continue to have their creative vision stifled by big studio interference. You'd think making two of the most stylistically impactful horror films of the past decade would be enough to give a director free range, but no. Art continues to suffer at the hands of the almighty dollar. What I'm getting at is, just let Robert Eggers show penises already. He's been wanting to for years, just give the man what he wants. Hello and welcome to The Martini Shot. My name is Brandon and today I am going to be reviewing the 2022 Viking revenge film, The Northman. But before I do that, it's time to ascend to the Halls of Odin through a Viking-inspired cocktail I'd like to call the Gates of Valhalla. There's a lot we don't fully understand about Viking culture, but one thing that we can all agree upon is that they enjoyed a good drink. Whether it be mead, grog, or cider, Vikings are commonly seen with a big mug of libation in one hand and a battle axe in the other. When coming up with this cocktail, I didn't want to go entirely authentic and try to replicate a drink they might have had in the past. Instead, I wanted to take some of the flavors commonly associated with Vikings to turn it into a modernized, approachable drink that I think a lot of people will really enjoy. This brings me to the Gates of Valhalla, my spin on a Viking sour that uses two key ingredients, mead and apples. Mead is one of the oldest examples of historic alcohol concoctions, being a fermented blend of water and honey. It was sort of a special occasion drink or reserved for royalty. Apples, on the other hand, were not only an important part of Viking diets, but their religion as well. Idun, a Nordic goddess associated with youth, spring, and apples. Her particular breed of apples were said to hold the power of eternal youthfulness and would be eaten by the gods whenever they grew too old. So I've decided to include mead with apple brandy to create a modern spin on Viking flavors. I've also decided to base the build off of a traditional sour because why not? There's some of the best type of cocktails out there. All right, let's go ahead and start with this drink. Uh, first with our alcohol, we are going to be doing one and a half ounces of apple brandy. Uh, there's a couple different apple brandies on the market that you can use. One of the more popular ones is Applejack, like this bottle right here. Uh, it's a little bit higher alcohol content, uh, but just for the sake of this video, I'm gonna be finishing out this bottle of Paul Mason apple brandy that I've had for a while. So like I said, we are going to do one and a half ounces. And then we are gonna be doing one and a half ounces of mead. And like I said before, mead is made with fermented water and honey. So you're going to get a somewhat slightly sweet nose on this one. Um, but if you've never had it before, it's very similar to kind of like a dry wine, just with more hints of honey in it. And I think honey and apples is a very good flavor pairing. So the Vikings knew what they were doing. Let's go ahead and get one and a half ounces. And now, even though there is honey in here, we are going to exemplify that a little bit with some raw honey. This is also going to give it a bit of a sweetness to it. We are going to do half an ounce of honey. And honey is pretty thick, so you're really gonna to need to shake this very well to get it to kind of integrate with the rest of the cocktail. Uh, but thankfully, because we're doing a sour, we are gonna be shaking this a lot. And I'll come back to that in just a minute. Let's go ahead and add our lemons in here. And because this is a sour, we are going to be using quite a lot of lemon juice. Typically, what you're gonna wanna shoot for is a range around 3 fourths ounce to one whole ounce of lemon juice. So like I said before, this was going to be a traditional sour build. Now, what does that really mean? If you're not super familiar with sours, there's a very key ingredient that goes into one of the more popular ones, a whiskey sour that a lot of people have kind of given me a side eye about because they're a little turned off by the idea of it being in their drink. And that ingredient is a egg white. So with the egg white, basically what it is there to do is to change the texture. It makes it very foamy and frothy and almost kind of dessert-like. But a lot of people are like, oh, I don't want egg in my cocktail. Understandable, but the thing you have to realize is with an egg, there's the egg white and the egg yolk and all of the taste of the egg is pretty much concentrated in that yolk, and we're not even gonna be using that. So, as long as you're careful and just get the white in there, you're not gonna taste any egg, and it's gonna make the drink all better for it, and I'll show you. And you do wanna try to be as careful as you can not to get any of the shells in here. Uh, however, if you do get a few pieces, straining it can usually help, uh, but if you are super worried about it, you can also double strain it. If you happen to have a fine mesh strainer, that just makes sure that no physical contents outside of the foam 
get into that drink. There we go. And there's a few ways you can go about adding egg white to a drink. You can either just pour the entire thing into a bowl and fish the yolk out, but then you do run the risk of piercing the yolk and getting it to drip into the cocktail, which is not something you really want to do. So you just kind of have to toss it back and forth until you get that yolk to finally come out. So now that we have all of our ingredients, we are going to be shaking, but we are actually going to be shaking this drink twice. The first shake we are going to be doing is what is considered a dry shake, and that is where you shake with no ice. And the reason we're gonna be doing that is because we need to emulsify that egg white in there. If you shake it without it emulsifying while you're shaking it with ice, it's uh, not going to allow a lot of the air bubbles that make it real frothy and foamy to develop. The water will kind of dilute it and you're just not really gonna get the texture that you want. So to start, we are going to be doing a very solid dry shake for about 20 seconds with a lot of elbow grease just to make sure we get that foamy texture that we're looking for. And another thing you need to be very careful about is because there's no ice in here, there's a lot of air, which means this can pop very, very easily. So you wanna make sure you're holding it as tight as you can while you're shaking, just to make sure you don't lose your drink and it goes everywhere. All right, that should be good. Carefully open. So now that we have it dry shaken, now we are going to add the ice to shake to chill. And we're gonna serve this the traditional way, and that is going to be straight up into this nice little coupe glass. There we go, so that's the drink itself. And for a garnish, I was kind of going back and forth on what I wanted. Thought about maybe doing a raspberry because I think Vikings ate those. Uh, but I think aesthetically, mint, a nice little mint leaf will look very nice on here. You just take the mint, clap it a little bit. You can dust it around here and we can just garnish that right in there. And there we go. That is the Gates of Valhalla. All right, let's go ahead and give this a taste test. So yeah, the biggest flavors that I'm getting on the initial sip is honey. Honey is there in not only the mead, but the raw honey itself. It's very sweet, very nice, and it pairs very well with this mint too. Because we did that little clap thing, you're getting a lot of aromatic elements of the mint there. And it pairs really well with not only the honey, but the little bit of apple you get too. It's very sweet and kind of juicy near the tail end of the taste. And the lemon really helps with that too, making it a complete sour. And of course that egg white, you can't do a sour without the egg white. It just makes the texture so much better, so much foamier, creamier, almost a dessert like. This is the only way to drink a sour basically. And this is a nice little addition to the sour family, I have to say. Very happy with this one. Definitely gonna be coming back to this one, probably in the fall. This would be a very good fall drink as well. I'm a kid. Starting out in the good old year of 895 AD, a young prince by the name of Amleth witnesses his father's murder and his mother's kidnapping at the hands of his traitorous uncle, Fjolnir. Amleth escapes into the sea, and years later he becomes a brutal berserker in a band of Vikings. After a casual evening of village burning, he encounters a seeress that foretells that Amleth will take revenge on Fjolnir, avenging his father and rescuing his mother. Joining forces with a witch named Olga, the two sneak their way into Fjolnir's farm under the guise of slaves and begin to enact Amleth's lifelong quest to see Fjolnir murdered. This film is directed by Robert Eggers, one of my favorite working directors and who I believe to be a pillar of the horror movie renaissance we've seen in the past decade. His first film, The Witch, or The Vavitch, like it says on the poster, is a slow burn nightmare set in America's colonial period and stands out due to its staunch attention to historical accuracy in the dialogue, something that would become one of Edgar's defining characteristics. The film is definitely one for the patient, and while I do think it has secured a defining place in modern horror, his following film, The Lighthouse, is nothing short of a masterpiece in my opinion. Powerfully atmospheric, intently researched, and incredibly entertaining, this film solidified Edgar's as a powerhouse director for me, being my second favorite film of 2019, right behind Parasite. 
It also happens to be the very first film I made a cocktail for for the martini shot. So if you want to see how young and dumb I was at the start, you can check that out here. Because of this film, Edgar's next piece of work automatically became my most anticipated film of the year. Now armed with a big, notable studio behind him and a much larger budget, it seems like all the cards are in place to make Edgar's a staple name in Hollywood. If you're not super familiar with Edgar's work or have been put off by auteur aggressively historical styles, I'm happy to say that The Northman is perhaps his most accessible film to date, aiming for a much more straightforward tale of revenge that shouldn't really leave you confused over what you just saw or what people are saying. While this is great for modern audiences, as a follow-up from a film like The Lighthouse, I can't help but feel like this was a minor step back. Not to say this isn't a good film, because it most certainly is, but it's hard to ignore that this film lacks some of the narrative complexity that made the previous films stand out so strongly amongst the pack. What does remain consistent across all of Edgar's work, including this one, is his unwillingness to shy away from making the dialogue as accurate to the time period as possible. With The Witch and The Lighthouse, many felt alienated by the fact that the dialogue wasn't very easy to understand, and subtitles were heavily required to figure out what the hell was even going on. They've never been a huge problem for me, as I think if you're paying enough attention, you can latch on to context through how they are talking rather than what they are actually saying. But The Northman seems to find a sweet spot between accuracy and accessibility. It doesn't completely spoon-feed you on the dialogue, but I did find it easier to rely on spoken word this time around compared to his past films. Another cinematic element paired with Eggers is his crafting of atmosphere with cinematography, sound design, and musical score. Shot on location in the rolling hills of Ireland, the film is undeniably gorgeous and sprawling. This is certainly Eggers' most grandiose film yet, even though it does take a noticeably contained approach to most of the story. The proof of his big money backing is certainly there, with a powerfully booming score to complement the sprawling landscapes that you'd probably find digitally created if this was any other blockbuster. Edgar's heavy use of natural light returns once again to further give the film a striking authenticity that only painstaking preparation can deliver. Entombed in the gorgeous film is also enthralling performances by the entire cast. Alexander Skarsgård as Amleth is an absolute animal here, driven by a primal lust for revenge in a fairly physical role that sees him climbing walls, hacking limbs, and beating faces in. Anya Taylor-Joy also does a great job as Amleth's supernatural-powered muse, Olga, bringing intelligence and guidance to Amleth's plan for revenge. Rounding out the cast is minor but solid performances from Ethan Hawke, Willem Dafoe, and even Bjork. They help drive the narrative's central ideas and aesthetic, along with Nicole Kidman delivering a powerfully haunting monologue later in the film in one of the most spine-tingling roles I've seen her in yet. So with all this praise, why does this film fall a little bit short for me? Well, like I said before, Eggers had a huge hurdle to overcome if he was hoping to top the lighthouse, and truthfully, this film just doesn't impact me in the same way this previous film did. The story is fairly straightforward and doesn't seem to have the same intriguing subtext as his past films, and I think a lot of that came down to studio interference. Eggers has already come out and said that the film would have had a much more artsy approach, but the studio pushed back to make it more accessible for general audiences. The middle ground he reached certainly isn't terrible, it just feels a bit more one note. The story has a few surprises here and there, but if you even have a remote sense of the story of Hamlet, you'll probably sense a bit of the familiarity here. The thing is, I wouldn't necessarily have a problem with it being a straightforward film about one guy trying to kill another guy, but the violence here does leave a lot to be desired. We do get a few beheadings here and there, and one instance of grotesque body manipulation, but a lot of the kills happen either off-camera or shrouded in darkness. When we do witness on-screen violence, many of the hits tend to lack satisfying impacts, and there's a surprising lack of gore as well. With a film so focused on the brutality of its lead character, I would have liked to see the film go all in on its gore. The best way I guess I can describe this film is a bit of a disappointing success. It's a solid film with gorgeous visuals and engaging performances, but I know Eggers had a better film in there somewhere, more in line with his past work. I can at least say comfortably that more audiences may find themselves drawn to this film, which in the end is a win for independent filmmakers everywhere. From the sound of it though, this may be the last time Eggers sacrifices his creative vision for a big studio. 
so I can only hope that this film gives him the success he needs to continue to make the movies that he wants to make. For my rating, I give this film 4 out of 5 Draugrs. Now let Eggers make the freaking Nosferatu remake already. Guys, thank you so much for tuning in to this edition of The Martini Shot. Did you see The Northman? What did you think about it? Let me know in the comments down below. And if you like what you saw here and would like to see more, don't forget to like and subscribe and follow me across all social media channels. And if you'd like to see more movie reviews and movie-themed cocktails, I have a blog, martinishot.blog, that you can check out. So with that being said, thank you guys once again for watching. I will see you in the next one. Live deliciously, but please remember to drink responsibly.